Okay, everybody, let's get started. And uh, today we're going to do Java Beans, uh, which is a continuation from what we were doing two weeks ago uh, in terms of Java servlets, JSP. Talked about that. I haven't really talked about the bean aspect yet. Uh, so let's see. Let me get this started. There we go. Oh, good. It works. It's good. Uh, so, Enterprise Beans. So, the concept of the enterprise being a little bit of an overview, and then a case study, sort of uh, an example, essentially going over how to build them, how to use them. So in terms of distributed, multi-tiered applications, what we're looking at um, is in terms of the platform is using distributed applications that are modeled after the enterprise applications. So OK, long story short, the beans, they sit in between everything, and they can provide the connectivity in the enterprise environment. So if you have a tiered setup, where you have a web tier going to an application tier, going to a bean server, bean container, probably. Bean container is going to, and one bean is in charge of, let's say, the database, and another bean is in charge of the file server or the email client or something. You separate the beans out as separate components. They provide the middleware between the server levels, between the application server and the persistent data server and some of the other intermediate layers which is everything I'm going to tell you within the next hour into a nutshell. <laughs> but that's only one component. That's how they sit into the picture. Application logic itself should be divided out into uh, functions or components in terms of their according to or divided out by their functionality. So various different components make up the EE system, uh, called from different machines depending upon the multi-tiered environment. As long as it's calling a bean, it doesn't really matter where the bean is located, so the beans can move around, the configuration can change, so it creates a lot more flexibility. Containers have um, applications and components that belong to them that um, can be used uh, to create uh, the desired behavior. And uh, here's a picture of the previous slide. This looks a little bit more sense, I think, um, or may, may not, depending upon your perspective. Uh, so we have application number one, application number two, different types of applications. They're all on the client tier, on the client machine. And this is, this is where the beans come into place. So as I was mentioning before, this is the web tier. Think of this as the tiering. Uh, so we have the client who's connected to the, the server, which is this. The server would be everything past the client this direction. But we have this tier. So we have the web tier, which we're going into the JSP pages. And that was what we talked about two weeks ago in terms of the, that component. Connecting to the business tier through, and this is the gateway here. We call it a gateway. I call it more of an interface. This is the interface from the beans. And down over here, we have the enterprise information systems tier. This is what EIS stands for. And only have on this slide database server machine. However, this could be other services, other enterprise services. As an example, if you had an ERP system, a CRM system, a supply chain management. Anything you had out here would be part of the enterprise information system tier for which the connectivity and the part in purple here is showing you the Java connectivity from the EE perspective. This connectivity is established through the bean layer or the business tier. So if we tear it out, that's how we're defining the business tier. And when you think about what is business tier, those are the business rules. <laughs> it's the contract, the policies, the rules that the applications play with the enterprise information systems. And this is hidden. This is on a back-end server that's usually on site. Usually the people at the corporate office are logging into this. This is the PeopleSoft system, the SAP system. These are all the systems that the corporate people, the headquarters are logging into. This business tier gives us the interface from the web from the outside world. So inside the company, if we were looking at this from a different perspective, not on the slide, but we could add in, instead of this client machine level here, we just put in you know, local login, which is a client, if you think about it. The local login is not going to go through, probably not going to go through the JSP, but they are still going to go through the beans. So the beans is sort of the protective layer, if you want to think of it that way. <coughs> so the components. So they're made up of several different components. The EE component, and this is the terminology in terms of this component, this component, this component, and how are we going to define components in terms of the terminology. A component by definition from an EE term, uh, 
Java J two E term, self contained functional software unit that is assembled into the application, which relates related classes and files that communicate with each other, and all of the other components are all housed together. So it's sort of like the equivalent of a package from a non EE perspective when you were writing Java programs and you use packages, you put things into packets. Well. Here we call them components. <laughs> so it's the business logic component. Or the, and components are used a lot with beans because we have containers that we stick the beans in, and the beans become the component. And the, the container really becomes the component. We add the container to the server, and voila, we have the connectivity. So the specification defines the following components. Application client applets are components that run on the client machine. <coughs> Java servlet. Uh, servlet pages, JSP, as we've see, seen a couple weeks ago, run on web components that run on the server. The Java Enterprise Beans, the J EJBs, are uh, Enterprise Beans, are components that run on the server as well. And here's our server communications protocol or configuration, where we have that web tier with the business tier. And this is nothing more than this one turned on its side. We're looking at this. I'm looking at this area right here. The purple, um, the purple things put on their side, <laughs> essentially. So the web browser, web pages, applets, optional being, Java being components. Actually, you could put Java being components out and uh, and deliver them in form of applets. Not very popular anymore. Nobody uses applets um, because applets take long to download, and you're giving your code away, and anyone can decompile a compiled Java file. So it's not very secure. And uh, it takes bandwidth, it takes time, and every single client downloads the same applet. So if they're going to do that, why don't you just stick it out here on the web tier, call it JSP, <laughs> and put make it make the applet into the bean, and put the bean out here on the business tier, and have the JSP called bean is what you're doing. So in the assignment that you're going to do for this course, the one that uses JSP, you're going to have an HTML page, you're going to have a JSP page, and then you have a Java.class file. The .class file is your makeshift bean. So in the real world, the bean would be sitting here on this tier. Obviously, you could put them all on one computer, especially for your testing. The JSP is going to run from the web tier. The HTML is going to run from the client tier. So the HTML connects with the JSP, which you know, it's a kind of a seamless kind of integration between the HTML and the JSP, if you think about it as well, because JSP runs from the web server. So it's kind of JSP slash HTML. That's out there for the client. The client uses it, sends the information, and then the bean activates, and the bean's going to be out here. So you can put all your proprietary, you know, passwords and I don't know, information in your source code in the bean. The client's never going to see it. It's going to be hidden, which is a lot better than putting it into an applet. So, uh, application clients, optional bean components. You don't actually have to go through the web tier. You don't have to actually use JSP at all. JSP is used if you want to go through the web tier. If you don't want to go through web tier, bypass JSP completely. Uh, in fact, you can just go directly and call a bean. HTML page can actually go out in there and connect via the backend server. Probably going to use another scripting language, though. Probably going to use PHP, maybe. You're going to use something. Because you got to get back here somehow. You're going to get back through a scripting language, whether it be a web scripting language or a scripting language in general. So You can also create JSP as we saw a couple weeks ago, just to refresh your memory because I know it's been a while, <laughs> take JSP and have that compiled into being components when it's run, which is what is ha what's happening anyway dynamically. The JSP that's out here on the web is en ends up running over here anyway. So um, either way, you're getting to the business tier. In terms of the client interface, the client consists of two parts, the dynamic web page containing the various different types of markups for HTML, XML. If you put XML out here, it just bypasses. It goes, in fact, you would, you would use XML to achieve this, this functionality without going through because XML is just nothing more than data tagging and the data is needed to send back to the business tier. So if you're not going to get it through an HTML form, you're just going to send it. Then uh, can bypass the web tier completely and just send it back to the uh, application server, the you know components, the bean component. Generated uh, web content running on web tiers. Also uh, web browsers which render pages, you know, received from the server to the server. And web browsers themselves are pretty um, 
pretty handy these days. I mean, they support practically everything. And it doesn't mean you can't put JavaScript or any other, other sort of language used in the interface. You could put that on the web tier as well, on the client tier, excuse me. Um, in terms of the applets, and just in case you've never heard of one, <laughs> so the web page received from the web tier can include an embedded applet. If it does, it's a small piece of code. It's written in Java, and uh, it's, a, it's a small client application, and it gets downloaded. So in the old days, you used to see on the bottom right-hand corner like a little Java symbol. In your, if you're running on a Windows machine, you know, a little Java thing. Oh, look, and you know, uh-oh, applet's downloading. It goes into the cache directory, and you wait there for five minutes, and then the application starts. But the funny thing about that is as soon as the uh, program's over with, you can still go back and run that applet if you wanted to. In fact, it's on your computer. So again, it's not too safe. And it takes time to download. <clears throat> In terms of the application clients, application client runs on a client machine and provides a way of the users to handle the tasks that require a rich user interface. Uh, can be provided by a markup language. Interesting thing, and we're getting more in the terms of application clients now instead of web browsers. So most people contact the internet, go out to the internet through a web browser, Internet Explorer, Firefox. Now we have web content enabled application clients that aren't web browsers, but they act like web browsers. <laughs> so <laughs> they're doing the same thing as a web browser, but they're a program. So most of your uh, EE development at this point is the thin client concept where everything's out on the server uh, because you can change it for everybody all at one time. A classic example of that would be your antivirus software at this point. If you haven't noticed your antivirus software has to go out to a service out there on the internet to update itself constantly. Well, everything, your configuration, your license files, everything is stored not on your computer. <laughs> you lose your internet connection, you've lost your antivirus software, essentially. However, it's not completely lost uh, because if you think about the concept, what do you need antivirus software for when you're connected to the internet? If your computer's never connected to the internet, you don't need any antivirus software. You're getting all your threats are coming from the internet. Uh, so, and if you've gotten something from the internet, then you've gotten hopefully something saved locally that's checking it as soon as it's coming in. So if you disconnect from the internet, you don't really need any protection. I mean, unless you've downloaded something before you disconnect it and your antivirus software didn't pick it up, it's not going to pick it up anyway, if you think about it. So if, if, doesn't, if, you're, if your virus uh, updates are out of date or you've got something that the software doesn't recognize, you're hosed anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so think about other different types of applications, usually ones that require keys or require authentication. They're running from servers. So they used to call this, um, well, it's, it's actually now application services that are running through clouds. So in the old days, they called it client server or enterprise edition. Now you can run applications from a cloud where you've got an icon on your local system. It looks like you've got the application installed, but when you click on it, it really just goes somewhere else. Run something. And that is equivalent essentially to a web browser, if you think about it. So, and some people are actually building applications through web browsers. A little bit archaic. That was the old way of doing something. Now you've got internet aware applications, you've got application clients that are having web capabilities embedded into them. So the application itself runs as a web browser slash application, but it's restricted to your own particular purpose. So. Anyway, that's modern day um, application development in terms of what uh, the modern trend is. Um, what we're looking at now as well as uh, typically graphical user interfaces that um, get, or cr get created, um, to, you know, in swing APIs and command line interfaces, everything's actually possible. In fact, you can create, well, you know, you can go backwards to the beginning of time in which we had uh, web browsers that were command line. You know, before we had Windows, before we had <laughs> graphical user interfaces, you could actually run uh, Mozilla or Netscape, actually, from a command line, and everything was command line, and, you know, you went and you got something, and it showed it to you on the screen, because you don't necessarily need a GUI for that, and it would show you the HTML all marked up, just like a web page. Uh, so you can actually, we, you, the capability is still possible, you can embed that into your application. 
Why use beans? Well, beans provide the developer architectural independence, which means you can have many different applications all using the same bean. So going back to and today, if you haven't noticed, is sort of application development 101 for the modern day internet aware bean component. Uh, so now you can have essentially five, six different types of applications. In fact, you get this. You get this with antivirus softwares as well, um, in which you've got different architectures, different types of computers running different versions of the same application, or maybe they're running differently. You've got pieces of the application that run from a mail client, ones that run from the internet, ones that run from the operating system, and they're all attaching to the same bean, they're all running the same functionality, and the bean is multi-purpose. So the bean works for everybody all the time, uh, which gives you independence. So you build the business logic functionality into the beans, you call the beans, and then um, there's no rework. There's no duplication of effort. As soon as you have the functionality working, it's a piece, it's a component part of the puzzle, and you reuse that part over and over and over again. It cuts down on the number of uh, developers you need, cuts down on the number of components, and makes things more universal. You know, it's kind of like if you had a company and you had uh, different people using different web clients for email, as an example, you wouldn't want to have like five different POP servers or IMAP servers. You just want one server. <laughs> one server is going to serve up for everybody, which is basically the concept. So economies of scale. So it isolates developers from the underlying middleware because the only environment they see is the enterprise Java Bean environment. So it sees the Java Bean. Also, the server client vendor uh, relationship, to, you know, to change makes it makes it for improvements for underlying middleware without affecting the user experience the use of the application or the enterprise. So you can take the beans, stick them on any middleware you want, add any middleware to it, move clients or beans around uh, different servers, different platforms. Uh, now, I shouldn't say, well, 99.9% .9 of all servers are compatible. It's just the Microsoft breed that's not compatible. So essentially, you're the TA, right? Okay, <laughs> good. I was waiting for the TA. I'm like, we got to do attendance today. <laughs> Very good. Um, sorry about that interruption there. Uh, but I just saw him walk in. I'm like, hey, I know you. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, what was I talking about? Architectural independence, essentially, moving components around. Um, oh, yeah, I was talking about Microsoft. I said, uh, it was a small, minor exception is Microsoft, actually. Uh, Microsoft servers aren't compatible with anything else. You can't run Java Beans. You can't run Java anything on a Microsoft server. If you're taking that route, you're taking the .NET route with the ASP instead of JSP, uh, which is a totally different class, totally different platform. But you could possibly imagine some of the limitations that might exist with that, especially all the things I've been talking about today is flexibility, components, interchangeability, architectural independence, all of the different features that make Java really nice don't exist on a Microsoft foundation. Um, however, Microsoft is uh, definitely has higher level security for some certain things, more streamli streamlined and more probably a faster executing middleware environment. The .NET is pretty quick and uh, has a lot more features that are built in automatically without you having to go out and install this, go out and install that. So if you take the Microsoft route, it's a pretty easy install. You know, it's one, put .NET on there, and everything works with .NET, and you just add components to it, and you turn features on and off, and you pay for it. But it's easier, actually. If you take the Java route, then you got to go, oh, what do I need this? And now I need that. And it's not automatically configured for you. You actually have to assemble all of the tiers, and you have to assemble the entire architecture. However, because you're making it, it's customized. So it's kind of like, you know, going back to the original PC and the concept of personal computing. You know, it's kind of like, you know, people who liked Windows because you could modify the system, you know, in the old days. Now people don't do that anymore. They just install it and leave it alone. But, uh, you know, you can't do that with a MacBook. You know, you just install it. <laughs> it's kind of like the difference between being able to customize and not. Then we have uh, write once and run anywhere type of terminology as well for server-side components. Uh, and there's your acronym, acronym for it. Uh, because the beans themselves are based on Java technology, both the developer and the user guarantee that their components are right once, run anywhere. As long as the enterprise bean server faithfully conforms to the bean specifications and the third party components should run on that particular server. 
which goes back to that public interface. If as long as you create a well-defined public interface, you keep the method calls the same. Then you have a write once run anywhere. Oh, you need a bean that does that? Here it is. Stick it over here. Call to it. Here's the address of the bean. And uh, you know the public interface to it, which is going to be your method calls and your, your ability to, you know, actually execute and run the bean. Then uh, it makes things simple. Uh, so it does take a little bit of pre-planning and documentation in terms of sharing the components. Establishes roles for the application development as well. So specifies specific roles for project participants charged with enterprise development of beans. People who write beans don't write JSP pages. People who write JSP pages, kinda, they probably could do the HTML parts, and they probably, most of them do these days. But in the old days, we had web designers, graphic artists who knew about colors and images and font sizes and stuff. They can focus on the user front end. And then you've got web developers, not necessarily graphic artists, but web development people that wrote JSP pages maybe some Bean components, and then you got your Java developers who are writing all back-end Java components. And so you can tear things off in terms of the development effort and have everybody working together. And keep a common, consistent interface between everything and swap the components out, essentially. So somebody can be working on a different interface for the back-end and it's all separated out by role, so um, hopefully it'll come together in the end. So it also takes care of transaction management. And I believe about three weeks ago, we went through the JTA, Java Transaction, um, the object itself that cr gets created um, in terms of, and most people slept through that lecture, I think, because it was kind of dry. But uh, t transaction management in general is kind of a dry topic to begin with. But um, the bean container component can manage this for you because it's written in Java. You can apply a transaction manager object to it. You can keep track of transi transitional spots. So as for example, if the bean that's connecting to the database becomes, and it gets an error and says, you know, this customer is not in the database, that information can go back through the line because you're look working with a compatible Java component that's working along with the transaction manager object can tell the transaction manager, no, customer's not in the database, thinks they are, but they're not. Uh, maybe they bought something and returned it or something, I don't know. And then, so they're in there, but they don't have an account established and they don't have information or something. There's something wrong with it, partially there. That could be part of the transaction management, essentially. It can go back and inform another component. So developers writing a business functionality doesn't need to worry about starting and terminating uh, transactions. You don't have to know anything about the transactions. All you have to know is the public interface to them. Um, and when I say public, I don't necessarily mean it's something that the client's going to call it. Another class is going to call it. So, also provides distributed transaction support, so which is uh, where, where you need that transaction object. So, and going back to something I said uh, in terms of the JTA lecture, um, most people, you know, don't really think about transaction management because in a non-distributed environment, because you can control it through the logic of the program for the most part. You know, if you can't log in, you can't do this, you can't do that. It's going to generate errors, right? You can do try and catches on stuff. And from a programmer's perspective, you can handle those exceptions and those situations, right? But what happens when it's in a distributed environment? That's when the JTA actually comes in handy <laughs> because it's not all running on the same computer. It's not all started by the same component. How do you know if the database connectivity failed? <laughs> you know? It's just blindly. In fact, I'm, I'm constantly surprised how many applicate, how many broken applications are out there that don't take advantage or don't utilize. So some of them are written in Java, don't utilize tr transaction management from a concept. You can tell. When you get, and I'm sure everyone in here has seen this before, funny little SQL errors that show up on the screen. <laughs> SQL, SQL dot something or other. Even basic users who don't know anything about computer science, they've, they've seen those errors before because some connection, or you see network errors, you know, and some you know, interesting little stuff that shows up because some connection to the database failed. And so instead of the result set coming back, you usually see this with shopping carts, and that, that really makes you feel uncomfortable because you just put your credit card information in there or something, and then all of a sudden you get this SQL, and then usually the screen goes white, and it says SQL 
something or other, air 99256. And then if you're like me, I'm immediately on the phone going, hey, you know what, I was just using your program, and I just put my credit card information in there, and I got this SQL error. You know, so does that mean my order's processed, or does that mean I have to do it again? And then they say, oh, no, 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 go ahead and just do it again. And I'm like, well, how can you say that? How do you know? You know, and then usually they come back, oh, that's because the server's down. Somebody rebooted it. <laughs> or, you know, it's being backed up right now, or there's something issue with the server. And you got that error because it, it didn't make it to the server. But instead of that error happening, if you had proper transaction management support in there, it would come back like the ATM machines come back and say, I'm sorry, but this ATM machine is no longer doing deposits or is no longer giving you receipts or is no longer going to print something out for you. That's the way you're supposed to do something. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it depends on the level of the business. Your smaller mama papa companies who have just websites with shopping carts and stuff, they don't do transaction management. You're going to get, you're going to see SQL errors, database errors, strange little debugging messages all over the place. Your ATM, they can't afford to mess up you, your account or your money. And they're federally insured, so they'll lose their insurance. Uh, so they're not going to do transaction management. So they're going to know exactly what happened. And actually, they're going to do logging as well. Everything you're going to do on that ATM is actually logged. Logged and saved for like 30 days or something like that. I didn't talk about logging, actually, but uh, there's a logging facility in Java as well to keep uh, automatic log information. Um, that is works along with the transaction manager object that keeps track of um, errors, uh, feedback, result sets, all sorts of different components. You know, there's lots of different methods you can run depending upon what it is you're trying to keep track of. Uh, so distributed transaction support. Transparency for distributed transactions means that clients can begin transactions invoked methods that are present with two different servers perhaps running on two different machines, two different platforms. And there's communication back and forth that says, yes, this one worked, yes, that one worked, okay, proceed. So it helps create portable and scalable solutions as well. I'll get my time piece out so I don't keep you all day. I have a tendency to talk too long when uh, I don't have my clock out here to know what time. We've we got plenty of time. I just started, but I just have to make sure that uh, I don't keep you too long. Uh, so it helps uh, with uh, portability and scalable solutions and uh, install and run portable fashion. So it's also another selling point for Enterprise Java Beans. And Enterprise Java Beans seamlessly integrates with Corba, which is our next lecture. It's lecture number seven. I probably should change the numbering around. This is eight, but I usually skip it and do it last because Java Beans actually works with Corba. So it's, it's kind of nice to see how they work together. But the Corba lecture is all Corba. So what is Corba? It's just another middleware. <laughs> so, so if you don't want to go to Java route, you can go to Corba route. Corba is compatible with Java and Enterprise Beans. Uh, so there's a natural combination of the components uh, for each other. They complement each other. For example, an Enterprise Java Bean may provide a Corba IIOP for the robust, and I'll talk about Corba next week, robust or the week after, depending upon how fast I talk today. Robust uh, transport mechanism for pure Corba clients. I can also access Enterprise Beans, currently highlights on, uh, of the OMG's Corba services. So it's the whole range of features that provide enterprise application, uh, enterprise application developer features. One is it, it's an API you add it in. In Java code, you say, you know, import, yada, yada, Corba. <laughs> you make Corba objects. Objects are request brokers. So. Common Object Request Broker Architecture is what Corbis stands for, which is, it's sort of like RMI where you get remote method invocation. These are common objects. So you create objects through a request broker. What's the request broker? It's kind of like the RMI broker, the RMI middleman who stands out there and says, what's the interface to this object? Which one do you want? Okay, this method's available and allows, it's like the traffic cop that serves up remote objects for clients. Corba does pretty much the same thing in almost the same fashion except for it's more than just for method invocations and it does more than just object organization and object placement. It actually provides a full middleware uh, so you can have a lot more services. You can run broker services to broker up objects. You can protect objects and it is specifically designed for the distributed application environment. So it looks for applications on multiple servers. 
Arma doesn't do that. <laughs> well, it does, but it's not as feature rich. And you can do a lot more in terms of enterprise-wide application development with Corba. A lot more features. There's a little bit of overlap as well. So RMI just does remote method invocation. It, that's stuck right there. Corba does a little bit more features. It's not just an object request broker. It has packages that you can install into it, services that you can install into it that does a lot more functionality. And uh, what is this functionality? Well, it saves you from stalling, installing two or three different things. You just install Corba automates a little bit more. It's all into one and there's a little overlap. Everything you can do with Corba you can do with other technologies. Everything you can do with other you can do with Corba. So it's like it's a one or the other. It's overkill if you're going to use RMI, JSP, <laughs> servlet pages and Java beans and Corba. It's a little bit it's a little heavy. You have a lot of middleware duplication. So a lot of people decide what route they're going to go. And usually what ends up happening is they go, oh, this server over here is on Corba. Oh, okay, we'll use Corba. <laughs> it's just easier to communicate with that server over there. When I say easier, it's just more efficient. So Corba, actually, because it's a middleware component as well, provides middleware security. I mean, there's overlap. And we have Java security, too, without Corba. But it integrates a little bit better. It's kind of like the differences between running, and I mentioned earlier, .NET. You know, you install .NET and you just run everything as a feature of .NET, right? Well, you install Corba is the equivalent. Actually, in terms of functionality, it's pretty the equivalent. And you run all the Corba components right there in Corba, and you can interface Java as the programming language to it. So you import the packages for Corba inside your Java program, make Corba objects, and run Corba services, and you do everything instead of having to do GNI, JSP, <laughs> Java Bs. RMI, JDBC, all this other stuff, all these smaller little components. So, long story short, not as, same problem with .NET, not as flexible. In uh, the Java, to compare pure EE with Corbo with .NET, EE and Corba, nah, Corba and .NET are more similar than EE, just regular old basic enterprise edition tool sets. When I say EE, I'm talking about naming services, JSP services, you know, RMI, JDBC, the whole package of what will be incorporated into EE. That's flexible. If you don't want to be so flexible, take the Corba route. It's easier. It's the equivalent to .NET, sort of, but the .NET is Microsoft. So it's not equivalent. In concept, it is. It's not it's totally different technologies, though. So don't get, don't walk away with, well, we can go with. Do you can't run Corbo with .NET. <laughs> Does not work that way. But you can run Corbo with Java. Does work that way. All right. So it provides uh, for vendor specific enhancements. Actually, Corbo provides vendor specific enhancements as well, which is it's an open it's an open uh, it's called open source, but it's it's uh, I would call, it's not freeware, it's not open source, it's, um, what do you call it, um, highly developed, highly specialized, um, very mature, it's been around since before, uh, before Java actually, came out right at the beginning of Java, so it's definitely highly supported and there's vendor specific support for different features of it that are pretty pricey actually. The cheapest route of everything is to go to Java route. There's no licenses to pay for anything. You know, JDBC is free, JSP is free. I mean, Corb is a step up. It's an upgrade to it. Um, I'll just put it that way. Uh, so the JV, uh, the Java Bean specific vendor flexibility vendors create their own enhancements in terms of the environment, the feature rich. So, uh, was I missing anything else on here? No. Simple wrap. Uh, about using Corba experts, yeah. Corba is actually kind of, um, I shouldn't say it's difficult, but you definitely have to have someone familiar with it, to, to and you don't have to work with Corba in this particular class. Uh, but and Corba works with other languages as well. It works with, um, actually works with Smalltalk, works with C, C++, stuff like that. Um, 
different other programming languages. Object. I don't know if I've never seen it worked with Objective C, but um, I wouldn't. Because of its openness in terms of the middleware capabilities, I would say it was probably compatible with. Don't quote me on this, but I think it's probably compatible with more languages than uh, the Enterprise Edition possibly would be. Enterprise Edition is just really Java component based. You can't really program with anything else. So, so the component architecture. So the server and the client tiers might also include component base for Java being component architectures called Java being components. This, were can, this is what I was talking about in terms of the container. Uh, so it manages the data flow between the application, the clients, the applets, the components themselves, running between the servers and the databases and all the different resources. So the components are not considered EE components, but are EE specifications. So they're not really, it's a concept versus an implementation. There's really nothing to write or to implement. You're just creating the abstraction. So the components themselves are properties that get set methods, excuse me, have, have get and set methods for accessing the properties in terms of the uh, beans that are housed inside of the components. They're used in various different ways, typically simple. In design and uh, implementation uh, should conform to the naming and the design conventions of the outline and the Java bean component architecture. And here's kind of a kind of an overview again, looking at the bean component, which is sort of optional if you think about it. So this is the same picture as we saw before, except for now instead of just the JSP pages going to the web business tier, this piece here was missing. So in the web, web tier, we added the Java bean components. Uh, so if we put a component bean or we, we create components in here. We can optionally select between different components for whatever request comes from the JSP page. Here's a classic example. We have two databases out here. One's Oracle and one's MySQL. We're not going to have one being connected to both. <laughs> we're going to have one being connected to one. We're going to have another being connected to the other. And so from the web tier, the components then inside their housed component, it's almost like a directory, if you think of it that way. We're going to look in there and say, do we have one for Oracle? Yep, here it is. <laughs> In terms of finding the sets and the gets for the component that we're going to run in terms of the instance of that bean object that's out there, the component manager is going to run essentially and allow us to find find the Oracle bean, find that MySQL bean, find the Informix bean or whatever database we have out there, or find none of the above bean and deal with it accordingly. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of the design, the applications. So a little bit more about the web components, and this is, would be considered the web tier. So we put the web components in here. So they're either servlets or pages created by JSP, as we've seen previously. And this is what we actually focused on in the last lecture a couple weeks ago. This was this is all we looked at actually in terms of, and that's where Java Beans was originally introduced. Well, unfortunately for you, well, fortunately for you, you don't have to write any beans for this course, for any of it, but you could write a bean if you wanted to quite easily. So it's just a Java program. <laughs> it's just the same way as an applet. You can write an applet real easily, too. If you've never written an applet before, no problem. Just inherit from applet. <laughs> so instead of going from object for an application, you're going from applet. Oh, well, you have an applet. So. And here, you just you don't even have to inherit. Like, it doesn't even work that way. You don't have to inherit from applet. Instead, you create the program itself with the functionality specific for it. It's all written in Java. <coughs> gets compiled in Java and it gets put out there. So servlets are Java programming language classes that dynamically process requests and construct responses that come, come back in terms of the request. And you know that JSP is Java code, but it's not compiled. It gets compiled. So JSP gets compiled on the server turns into a servlet, creates a servlet object, or you can create the servlet object ahead of time and don't call it from JSP. And don't create it, don't use the JSP route. JSP, the programming language that's used in there is Java, not JavaScript. Not, it's just pure Java. So. What I'm going to do, and the reason why I'm kind of bringing up this kind of top topic terminology is this is what the final is going to be about. So. Just a preview of what you're going to expect, because the final is coming up in the next about three weeks. I'll have a review once I've actually put it together. Uh, it's not going to be the same final that the uh, weekend people got. It's going to be a different one if you haven't taken it yet. 
Uh, it's going to be multiple choice as well, just the same kind of format. Uh, but I'm just going to ask you questions about terminology, you know. You know, just stuff like that. Just, you know, differences between JSP and servlets, differences between uh, what is a Java bean, per se, versus a JSP page versus a servlet kind of thing? What's a web tier? <laughs> kind of, you know, it's just basic stuff like that. It's not, not going to be hardcore um, in terms of having to memorize programming language syntax. There's no programming on the exam, and there's no syntax on the exam. But the concepts themselves are um, pretty important to know. But I will review in the next couple weeks, let you know. Uh, the week before the exam, I will review so you know. Some of you have actually taken the exam for the weekend class already. Uh, that was a couple weeks ago. So. But you have it out of the way <laughs> if you did that. Um, so static HTML pages and applets are bundled with web components during the application assembly. They're not considered part of the web components. Uh, Server-side utility classes can also be bound with web components like HTML pages, but they're not also considered web components either. So here's our business tier and our enterprise information systems tiers, giving you the more complete picture. So what we've seen so far is this point with EIS, or we've you know we, we can actually break it out into a, yet another component here, and we can say now we have entity beans, session beans, and menu-driven beans. So this is where we get our different types of beans that go past the Java Bean component level. So in terms of the business here, this particular set of beans, entity, session, message driven, which are the three different types of beans that end up in the business tier that work with enterprise information systems, they're custom designed for the EIS. So out here we might have a legacy database, we might have a you know, we might have an ERP system, a CRM system. There's, unfortunately, the slide set only really shows you databases. But there's more things out there than a database. But everything is database oriented these days. Long story short, these beans are keeping track of information that's going out here so that we can have persistent data and we can have um, sort of a seamless state that's um, kept from a condition that's not, uh, that's not stateful. That's, you know, and we're going to have this, you know, Information about the session, information about result sets, um, whether something was used, whether something was not used, requests that are being made. Think of this as um, old-fashioned cookies and session information. <laughs> it usually is over here on the client side, but now it's on the server, and it's being used on the server to keep track of transactions that are occurring and information that's going back and forth between those enterprise information systems. So on the business components, what we're doing is sort of moving this way. So we had uh, started out, I started talking about the Java, Java server pages, went into Java beans. Now we're on, now I'm going to talk about this little box here, the business tier. So business code, business logic. It's the logic that solves and meets problems for particular business solution, banking, retail, finance, depends on the situation, depends on the domain. Handled by the enterprise beans running with the business tier. Different set of beans, just note it's a different set of beans. It's not the same kind of bean that runs here. This type of bean out here, that's optional actually, connects you to services. It doesn't necessarily become a mediator between you and an application. You or you know, you are the, the server. So it just does nothing more than connect, get information, provides utility, provides access to the resource. We were looking at business logic and business tier when we start thinking about, well, how do we uh, figure out if this person is eligible for a discount? You know, how do we figure out, you know, we're, now we have business logic. Um, how do we know if they're able to do a withdrawal today or deposit? So the previous slide shows an enterprise bean, retrieves data from client programs, processes it if necessary, sends it to the enterprise information tier for storage. Enterprise bean also retrieves the data from the storage processes it, sends it back to the client. So these guys here are the worker bees for the applications that are on the business tier, off of the business tier, the EIS. So here's our different types of enterprise beans. So enterprise beans, three kinds of beans. We have session beans, entity beans, and message-driven beans. As I mentioned before, these are the beans I'm talking about. 
It's important to actually kind of visualize it as well. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not talking about these beans anymore. <laughs> I'm not talking about the beans that work with the JSP pages. I'm talking about business tier beans. Session bean represents a transient conversation with the client. It's the session. That's what I was mentioning before. It's the session data. But instead of being held on by a server, it's held by a bean. So we can keep session. If you've ever done any web programming, session is a session. It's the same concept. Um, it's environment variables. It's information that's being stored. But this can actually have more functionality to it. And this can store it from a business tier perspective instead of a web server. Because this isn't on the web server anymore. If we're on the web server, we're going to use session states. <laughs> we're going to use session information from a web development perspective. If we're off the web tier, we're further back on a business tier, we're going to use a session bean. So the session bean, when the client finishes executing the session bean and its data are gone, because we don't have any more client connection, we don't have any more session information. So it takes the place of the session feature that we would normally have on a web tier. Entity bean represents persistent data stored in one row of the database table. Think of this um, like a result set. So entity goes out, gathers the information, holds on to the information. Where else is it going to go? Without the tiering, the client would make a request to the Java bean in the middle, the J, the, the, the enterprise Java bean that's not on the business tier but in the middle. It would go to the database, would take the results, send it back to the client, no more results. <laughs> so instead, the enterprise level, excuse me, the um, business tier level, entity bean, can hold on to that information. What's that information? Well, when you log into your bank account through the ATM, that information is not stored on the terminal, <laughs> which would be the client, it's stored in an entity bean where the entity bean knows who you are, because you already entered the information at once. And it already done, it, excuse me, it already went out to the, to the star service or whatever service you happen to use from the database level. It found the information, looked you up as a client, said, oh, here's all the stuff, stored it in this bean. Entity bean represents the result set that comes out of that database. Maybe it's from several different databases, and maybe it's from several different queries that run. It's not, just, it's not just the equivalent to a result set. It's storing data, however. And the data represents you for this particular transaction. So the session and the entity sort of work together. So we can say, you know, would you like to do a withdrawal? And it comes back and says, hey, you know what? You don't have enough money in the account to do a withdrawal. It doesn't even have to go back at all to the database. The entity being already has that information. We already know how much is withdrawn. So you can think of the entity being as the cache, cache memory, that's from the transaction. So you're manipulating the cache, you're not going back. What does that do? It cuts down on the amount of database traffic. Not all of your requests are going to there. Only when it's done and it's going to be committed will it ever go back to the database. Instead, the entity being takes care of that work. So beans in general are designed to take care of work, the worker bees. So at the business tier, they're worker bees for the resources. They're cutting down on the traffic that's going to that resource. Okay, so if the client terminates or if the server shuts down, the underlying service ensures that the entity data, the bean itself, is saved. You know, if you made a, let's say, for example, you went to the ATM machine and you deposited a check, and in the middle of the transaction, the system died because it had bad weather and the power died. Well, the entity bean is going to take care of that. It's going to, it's, it has the data. It has everything that you basically were doing. It knows exactly, and it can roll back and commit, can do anything, depending upon the situation. You know, in some cases, actually, if you've already given it the check, it puts it, but it puts pending next to it or something. I don't know. It hasn't, I've never had an ATM machine die on me when I was making a deposit. I have, however, had ATM machines not give me cash. When an ATM machine is going to run out of money, Sometimes the last customer who uses it, <laughs> then you got to go into the bank and you got to go, hey, uh, there's something wrong with that ATM machine. And then they, they go, oh, yeah, it's out of cash. And then it triggers the next customer goes in there and go, oh, sorry, we're no longer doing withdrawals. We're out of cash. And they actually put cash in those machines, by the way. But they're smart these days. In the old days, people used to steal the ATM machines. <laughs> 
Now even like you go to the shopping malls, they're built in the walls. There's a there's it's not a standalone machine anymore. Although you go into the little liquor stores, the gas stations, and they got those little. But people still steal those things. They're pretty heavy though. You know, you gotta bolt that thing down to the ground. It's full of cash. Well, it might be full of cash. Depends upon how many people used it. So, anyway, long story short, don't steal an ATM machine <laughs> unless you want to break your back. It's pretty hard. <laughs> And if you do, the entity being way out there is going to hold all the information for whatever happened. So if the machine's gone, don't worry about it. Your transaction will still work. So Message driven being the last but not least, different type of being combines features of session beans and Java message services, JMS. So it's a message listener <coughs> allowing a business component to receive JMS messages asynchronously. On your messages, so for synchronizing um, message passing between different components for the service itself, it's actually kind of trivial. It's kind of like JNI, the naming um, lookup, the naming index. It's uh, think of it more along the lines of a feature that can be used for communication, and uh, the message-driven bean does just that. It works with JMS to communicate back and forth, and how is it messages that are designed for the component that the message was sent to? So in terms of the enterprise information system tier, this is what these three types of beans are connecting to and using. The uh, handles the software, includes enterprise infrastructure such as, and this is what I was saying before, ERP, CRM, you know, anything supply chain management. Most people actually are starting to use the word ERP to represent everything, enterprise resource planning. What's ERP? Well, it's supply chain management, <laughs> it's resource planning, it's manufacturing stuff, it's uh, ordering, receiving, everything ends up in this ERP system. Uh, the ERP system is an example of an EIS, Enterprise Information System. And usually these types of systems are running in distributed environments with multiple connections. So we have vendors that log into them, customers that log into them, rarely, depends on the system but employees that log into them, applications that log in. So you can provide automation. Not limited to ERP. You can put customer relationship management out here. You can put uh, anything you want, separate types of enterprise systems. Mainframe transaction processing, a.k.a. ATM. <laughs> ATM machine is a mainframe transaction processing kind of environment. So your, ER, your enterprise information is your ATM database. It's the housing. In fact, it's going to be a data service that's going to do the interconnections between all of the different, sort of like an ERP system, doing all the interconnections between all the banks. Because if you go to one bank and you're on the STAR network or the XYZ network or whatever happens to be the network, it's defining which, e which system EIS you're actually attaching to. The EIS has to be compatible with your bank because it has to know about your bank. So usually on your card it says which systems. There's like half a dozen of them on there. You know, it's a com competition. They all pretty much are doing the same thing. Some of them uh, perhaps are local. Some of them are, you know, in different states for when you travel. Around here it's mostly Star over here. There's another one. I can't remember what it's called right now. It's mostly Star Network, which is nothing more than an enterprise information system that has interconnections with all the banks, and it's doing transaction management. And there's where your dollar fifty ATM machine fee is supposed to be going to. Supporting this network, who's going to pay for the network? <laughs> Which is ironic when you go to the bank and you're at your bank and then you're using the ATM machine that's out in the front. You should not be, be charged a fee because you're connecting right to the bank. <laughs> now, if you're in a shopping mall and you're using a bank that's not yours, you should be charged a fee because you're using this the network and the network. Someone's got to support the infrastructure, right? Pay for all this stuff. So, are they still charged? I haven't used an ATM in years. I guess I don't like ATMs. <laughs> I think they're still charging fees, right? Yeah. Some banks went to a monthly processing fee. Instead of charging you per transaction, I think, I don't know if it was Wells Fargo or somebody like, $10 a month if you use the ATM machine or something, or $5 a month if you use the ATMs. Like, well, how do you know you're going to use them? So, I don't know. Uh, database systems are out there, old legacy systems are out there, anything you want can be out there actually. As an example, the Java 2 EE application components might need access to enterprise information systems for database connectivity. I would say so. 
I mean, they're not going to know about everybody. They're database connectivity to connect different services. So normally we have what's called thin clients. ATM machine is a pretty thin client. It's a screen with a, depending upon where it's housed, it could be full of something or it could be full of nothing. It could be an empty box, essentially, with a screen and a keypad. And a card reader is what it's got on there. Uh, thin, multi-tiered applications. They're hard to write because they involve many different lines of intricate code to handle transactions and state management, multi-threading, resource pooling, and other different types of things. So if you're not doing the container route, you're going to do the application by application, you're going to stick everything on the client. It's kind of pretty hard to do that. So if you think about the concept, you build the infrastructure, then you build the thin client that connects to it. And so then you can get clients from the web, clients from ATMs, clients from different resources. In fact, the system that you use in the liquor store or the grocery store when you go swipe your card to pay for your groceries, the same system. <laughs> it's all the same system. Well, the clients are thinner in the grocery store than they are at the ATM machine. But uh, see, so component-based and application-independent JR2E applications themselves are easier to write organized into reusable components, obviously. In addition, server provides underlying services to form the container for every one of the component types. So the service slash concept of the container is implemented in there as well, in terms of the platform. And because you don't have to develop these services yourself, you are also free to concentrate on solving the business problem at hand and not worrying about all of the different architectural components. So you're uh, essentially using container services and putting stuff in the services. It's, um, I want to call it a design pattern, but it really doesn't fit into that category. It's, um, what you get when you take this route is more of a template or a best practice sort of method. Not necessarily a design pattern, but I don't know. It automates it because it makes it simpler in term, it automates the development because it makes it simpler to make these components. So container services are the interfaces between the components and the lower level platform and functionality that supports the component. So if we go back to this little picture over here, we have to have inside of the middleware services <laughs> that run, and this is what the container services are all about, that say this beam belongs to this guy over here, this guy over there. It's a network service, if you think of the concept of uh, as a networking component. Um, probably a better perspective on that. So before the web component, enterprise beans, and application client components, before they can be executed, you have to assemble them into a module and deploy them into a container. Nothing more than uh, housing them in a particular location on a server. Assemble the process involves uh, the assembly uh, specifying the container itself, sending the con each component making it available. For as an example, how easy it really is, let's say you're, com you're deploying uh, bean components and you're going to run them with JSP and you're just going to put them in a you know, server. It's a matter of just loading them up into a directory <laughs> and starting the server. And you have automatic scripts that go through this, hey, we got this bean, we got that bean, we got this bean. Registers and makes instances of all of the different objects that are there. Which is kind of similar to the concept of loading RMI. You know, we went over that, but a little bit more complicated because you have to manually load the interfaces and manually start the instances and stuff like that. Here the server is going to do it for you automatically. And the container settings customize the underlying support for the service as well, including services such as security, transaction management, Java naming, that's the uh, naming and directory interface. So JNDI is Java naming and directory interface. It's a lookup. So it's sort of like uh, the registry but it's not. Registries is, uses, is used with RMI. The generic form of that is JNDI, which is sort of like a domain name service in terms of its functionality. So when you type in google.com, something, there's a server out there you're going to hit that's going to have a lookup. It's going to say, oh, that's an IP address, blah, 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 blah. And it takes you to the, well, this is, does the same thing, essentially. I want the XYZ bean. Where is the XYZ bean? Yeah. So then the naming and directory service go back. Oh, it's component XYZ123 on server 456 or something. And it tells you where it is, provides the name lookup. It's uh, directory services. You would think of it that way. So here's some highlights on the container services. Obviously, uh, you don't have to implement this. And this all has changed or is in the process of changing. 
as everything happens with Java every t every couple months. Actually, I'm finding this to happen a lot with a lot of different tool sets. <laughs> but uh, everything just keeps changing and changing. It's like you have to run in place to keep up with what the current services and features that are available, which is good. It means that there's a progress in the development community. However, your skill set gets outdated significantly you know, fast, significantly quicker than it ever used to, especially when now you've got different, I mean, the core language of Java has stayed the same. But uh, throughout the last couple of releases, man, there's been some different base classes. There are some different abstract classes that have been added to it. And it's kind of interesting. All right, so security. We would not want services without security, right? So container services provide security mechanisms, lets you configure web components, enterprise beans. System resources are accessed only through authorized users. So you can't just have anybody out there. It's on the Internet. You know, I'm going to have some sort of a level. I'm not going to get into the security features themselves, but just know that the container services, which is the service that's running to establish the connection between the different tiers, especially between the business, those three different types of beans with the EIS systems, you're going to run a container service, and you're going to get security. You're also going to get transaction model as well. It's transactional support. Uh, so it lets you specify relationships among methods and make single transactions so that the methods of one transaction are treated as a single unit. So minimal some transaction support. You also get the JNDI lookup service. And the lookup service itself provides a uni unified interface to multiple naming and directory services. Um, so the application components can access naming and directory services, find each other. <laughs> so the component can find the EIS and the, the method or the feature or the functionality. So you're going to get that. You're also going to get the remote connectivity model, which is very similar to the RMI platform, actually, because we have to find objects that are on another server. So it manages the low-level communications between the clients, the enterprise beans themselves. And after an enterprise bean is created, the client invokes methods on it as if it were the same virtual machine. Well, what does that sound like? RMI. <laughs> so it does essentially the same remote method invocation. So. And here's another picture for the container types. Now you're saying, I thought we knew everything there was about containers. This is container services. Container services run with and seamlessly integrating the different tiers in the terms of the breaking everything out into different levels or layers of the hierarchy of the tiering of the servers. We have different container services for different tier levels. <laughs> so we go back to this. And we have over here, we're going to just call this the J2EE server. We have the web container. We have the EJB container. So we have container services that we can run between the two containers, which you know is nothing more than another abstraction here between the application client container. Call everything a container and run services. And what you're doing, you're making an instance of a service object, and you're call me calling methods on the service object to keep track of the different containers. So uh, for, for those things I just rattled off to you, security transaction. This is just a handful. This is not a, an inclusive list of what's provided. It's just an overview. And uh, here's the database out here, or the EIS, or the other component that you're connecting these servers to. And then we have the web browser, or the application client. This slide, I like it because it kind of pulled things out into two separate, because we're seeing more of this, actually. We have the simple browser, then we have the application code, which is a browser, sort of, but it's also an application. So the client container from the client machine connecting through this way, connecting through this way. These guys are connecting, and then we're connecting out this way. That's really the big picture in terms of the container types. Here is a brief example of some different types of containers. Um, not all of them are in here, but uh, just as a couple of examples. And these are just a small set of examples, but they're most common types of components. The server itself, as a hierarchy, can be a container. So that's this concept here as an outer container. Okay. So the server, the runtime portion of the EE product, provides the enterprise beans and the web containers, which are in there. The enterprise bean container itself manages the uh, execution of the enterprise beans, obviously. 
and the web container is going to manage the execution of the JSP pages, the servlet pages, all the components that are associated with the web tier. That's this guy here, JSP and servlets. And I believe it or not, actually, this is all you have. This is the entire EE platform. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty much all. It's pretty much inclusive here. I uh, got well. It's missing Java beans. You can actually put some beans up here. It's it's missing the basic beans. We have the the uh, enterprise beans, but we're missing the well, we're missing the the EIS beans. That's what we're missing. The session beans, the entity beans, and stuff like that. But that's okay. It's pretty inclusive. And uh, we have the application client container. That's this guy over here. And uh, it manages the execution of the client's application client components. Application clients in their containers that run on the client machine. I don't really think of a browser having a container, however. So there's really no container associated with a browser. So now, browser is sort of like a utility, a tool. So. Applet container, thing of the past, really. But uh, we could add one. Uh, manages the execution of applets consistent with the web browser, Java plugins, running on the client together. So when we package the application together, this is sort of what it looks like when we create the packaging. Because we're not going to take this whole thing and have a million different dot class files everywhere. <laughs> so we're going to package it together. So in terms of the application packaging, we have our assembly root. We have our web modules, we have our EJB modules, resource adapter modules, application client modules, all the little pieces together. And lo and behold, we use XML as the interface. Nothing more, you know, call it application.xml or sun application.xml, depending upon what server you're running on. Depends on the server type in terms of the meta info, which is going to be the data about the data. The data about the data, <laughs> essentially. What's in the package is sort of like the directory lookup. You put it all together, you only have one item, two items, three items. It's not like a bunch of files you have to go and configure all over the place. You package it in terms of the packaging concept. So you package the application up, you have a configuration file. The configuration file is basically going to specify that pattern, the location, the subdirectories, information. Well, XML is a data markup, so it's marking up this data to tell you what's in the package. So what are transactions to a user? Uh, yeah, this is not, this is a refresher on the transaction, and I'll end, let me see, it's 12.15. Well, we didn't start till like 11, I think. I'll end in 15 minutes, how's that? We'll see how far we get. We actually covered the Java transaction. Um, modules and the JTA uh, packages and stuff, and, but it was several, several weeks ago. I'm not going to go through it all again, so I'm going to talk about naming conventions and how that fits into concepts. And these are some miscellaneous, the, the rest of this slide actually goes into some miscellaneous concepts. Um, to recap, the concept to put all the pieces together to give you the big picture. Uh, so the transaction to the user, it's a single changed, single changed event that either happens or it doesn't happen. Either I made a withdrawal or I did not make a withdrawal. So, to the system implementers, transactions programming styles enables you to code modules that participate with distributed computations. So it's a series of events that lead up to the did it work or did it not work. Transferring money from a checking to a savings account is a good example of it. There's a lot more steps in there than the transaction of transfer. So, sounds easy, but a distributed model needed uh, needed con transaction control. That's where we get the Java transaction service. So that's the transaction manager object that I talked about several weeks ago. Uh, keeps track of the progress of transactions. Commits and rollbacks the entire transaction. Updates databases, multiple databases. Um, that may actually happen, or multiple tables and databases. OK, so we also have naming, as I mentioned before. Naming, there's nothing really to these technologies, actually. It's, they're kind of simple. Um, the naming system itself provides a natural understanding way of identifying associating names with data. So when we call something this, it, it means that over there. So it enables humans to interact with complex computer addresses, systems, associated data, and objects, and simple names. Imagine if you had to use the real names of all of these different servers. You know, they're going to be partly a port, an IP address, an application, uh, who knows, a container. All this stuff that's associated with it, 
it's just as I was mentioning before, kind of like how we can remember Google, but are we going to remember 192 dot blah, 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 you know? It doesn't provide the same thing as domain name lookup, because domain name lookup will actually take a domain name and mark it with thousands of different servers. <laughs> And it's used for a different purpose, but it's extremely close in concept. So we say that the Oracle server is on this machine, and it has uh, this IP address, and then we can access it through this port, and it's connected with that web server over there. And we put all this stuff, and we make it easier, human readable, and we put it into a we put it into a database essentially. So independent from the computer systems that use them, so we just change them. When we need to, when the systems themselves move, I mean, it can serve as a system that uh, can connect to them, understands their protocol. Here's how it works. It's called GNDI, Java Naming and Directory Interface. We have our Java application, and kind of like our web browser. Actually, if you think about this from domain name perspectives, that's the first thing that happens. It goes to a domain name server, it resolves the address, then shows you the page. Well, it's the same thing. Look at the GNDI um, API find the naming manager, find the server the Java application is actually supposed to go to. And these are different types of servers out here. We have an RMI, oops, we have RMI out here, we've got Corba out here, which actually has its own naming convention system as well. Uh, NIS, NDS, DNS, here's a DNS server out here, LDAP, you know, OLAP, you can put anything you want out here actually. <laughs> so it just gets registered through the naming manager. You use the API to go through the rate. Basically, contact the naming manager who's going to keep track of it. Um, let's. I'm going to actually, this is a really good stopping point because this is going to get into. Someone remind me, I stopped on slide number 28. <laughs> this lecture. So next time when I come in I can ask right after Java name goes. Not too much left to the lecture, but I don't I don't wanna it puts some big pictures together and I don't want to rush through it and I'm feeling like I'm rushed. So I'm rushing myself. But I stopped on slide number twenty eight, so you guys know that. Um I wanted to make a couple of announcements because we are getting closer to the end of the term and uh I've been doing this for all of my classes, so we can kind of figure out what's going on. Today's the fourth. Our final exam is on the 25th for this class. However, you can take it on the 23rd if you want. So these are familiar. Monday or Wednesday, you can take it from 10 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It will be a multiple choice exam. But if you want to wait till the 25th, that's when it's technically supposed to be, but you don't have to which gives us approximately two weeks. The 18th is the day you definitely want to show up for. That will be my final exam review date. <laughs> so I will be telling you everything that's on the exam on the 18th. Well, as much as I can. It's going to be on the exam. Next week, I'm going to finish this lecture, and I'm going to talk about CORBA. And that's the last lecture of the course, actually. CORBA is a really short lecture, believe it or not. So we'll finish all of the data up on the 11th. And then I'm, I, I'm definitely putting together, because certain copies of the exam from the weekend are in, out in circulation. So I have to write a new exam for this class. <laughs> so <laughs> it'll happen uh, sometime within the next couple weeks. I might see, keep some of the questions the same, but I have to, I have to mix it up a little bit, uh, because students are students. and. Uh, They'll take advantage of anything they can. <laughs> so long story short, makes it so I have to create a new exam. Uh, so on the 18th, I'll have everything prepared for that. So I can, because I can't really tell you right now what's going to be on it anyway, even if I wanted to. So questions, comments, concerns about the end of the course. And we will, I will definitely be here for the 11th and for the 18th and for the 25th. There's no more time off anymore. Uh, sign the roster if you haven't signed the roster yet. You want to be in attendance so you can get a grade for the course. Questions? We're done. <laughs> no more for today, which is good. It's good timing. Easy day. Let me stop this.